Hello everyone and welcome to the first in our Mind Gardens Tertiary Referral Service for Psychosis webinar series. My name is Julia Lapham. I'm the Clinical Director for TRSP or the Tertiary Referral Service for Psychosis. I'm a clinician, a psychiatrist and a researcher and I work at, as an Associate Professor at UNSW School of Psychiatry and as the Clinical Director for TRSP. I have over 20 years experience working clinically and in research aimed at improving outcomes for people living with psychosis. So before we start today, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country and of lived experience. I acknowledge the strength and resilience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are the traditional custodians of the diverse countries from which we're joining this meeting. I'm privileged to be calling from the land of the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. I also acknowledge people with lived experience of mental ill health and recovery and the experience of people who have been carers, families or supporters. So welcome again to the Mind Gardens Tertiary Referral Service for Psychosis seminar series. The TRSP is a New South Wales Health funded statewide service, which is hosted by South East Sydney Local Health District. And we're very grateful to South East Sydney Local Health District, New South Wales Health, and to the Mind Gardens Neuroscience Network for their ongoing support of TRSP. So what is TRSP? Well, we aim to improve the lives of people living with complex psychosis. We do so through delivery of our clinical service populated by a multidisciplinary team. We welcome referrals from across New South Wales of anyone living with psychosis and cared for in New South Wales public mental health services. We also run education and training, training programs aimed at developing a community of practice for capacity building in complex psychosis care. And this webinar series is an example of that capacity building. The webinar series is supported by Mind Gardens Neuroscience Network. Mind Gardens is a partnership between its members, Neura, the Black Dog Institute, UNSW Sydney, and the Southeastern Sydney Local Health District. Mind Gardens was established in 2019 to enhance collaboration, building translational research capacity in mental health, drug and alcohol and neurological disorders. It brings together clinicians, researchers, health service administrators and people with lived experience to design research and quality improvement projects that match with consumer priorities and make a real difference in people's lives. So finally, the Mind Gardens webinar series will run through 2023 monthly. So please look out from, for emails from TRSP events, which will detail future webinars, all tailored for clinicians. There's a little bit of housekeeping for everybody on board. So you will notice that you're all muted. And if you have questions for the speaker, they will be best addressed if you can add them to the Q&A. There will also be a simple anonymous poll towards the end of the webinar. If you could please complete that, that really helps us understand how worthwhile this event is. We also genuinely appreciate your feedback by email, including topics that you would welcome to be talked about at future webinars. This event is recorded and we will distribute a link to the event video within two weeks to those who have provided an email address. You can opt out of our communications at any time with a return email with unsubscribe in the subject line. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Dan Siskin, to provide the inaugural webinar in our TRSP series. Prof Siskin trained as a psychiatrist in Australia and the United States. He works clinically as a psychiatrist in Brisbane, Australia, with people with treatment refractory schizophrenia. Dan's research interests include treatment refractory schizophrenia, clozapine and the physical health comorbidities associated with schizophrenia. He has over 200 publications, all very good, and over $41 million in competitive research grants with over 6 million as CI. So over to you, Dan, for your talk entitled 
clozapine for clinicians, everything you wanted to know, and much more you didn't. Good day. All right. Thanks so much, Julie and Julia, for organising today's talk. And I'm incredibly honoured to be um, talking to you guys today. Um, as uh, Julia said, I am a psychiatrist in Brisbane. I'm a clinician and I'm very lucky to get to do a bit of research. Um, I am in clinic today. My registrar is off sick, so I'm covering her clinic and my clinic. So it's a little bit chaotic today. There's a very good chance a number of case managers will burst into the door throughout this talk asking me what, why, why am I not seeing patients? So I apologize in advance if that happens. And so one of my interests is clozapine because that's mostly what I do. I see people with treatment of fractal schizophrenia on clozapine. Now, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. If you um, want to put your answers into the chat section, I'm not going to be looking at the Q&A until Julie asks me some questions at the end. But if you got, um, I'm going to ask you some questions. I'll try to make this interactive because the... I just find didactic lectures just bore the pants off me. So I'll try to make this a bit of interactive through the chat function. All right, so none of the work um, that anyone ever does, particularly mine, is not done without the amazing colleagues. So I've got my colleagues at the Pharmacy Australia Centre of Excellence, Griffith, UQ, um, to thank. And also I, a lot of what you're going to hear today is actually was the registrar scholarly projects um, that have been done over the past few years. And I've got a number of amazing registrars who are actually far more than are on this list now who've assisted um, some of the stuff I'm going to present to you today. So who here has ever done the clozapine clinic? Like who's, um, who's actually been either a nurse in a clozapine clinic, a case manager as part of a clozapine clinic, a registrar, a consultant? Has anyone ever here worked with people with clozapine? All right, I've got a couple of people have raised their hands. Wonderful. Who thinks that clozapine is totally benign? All right, I'm seeing a bunch of hands going down here. And then who feels completely comfortable with their skills as a clozapine prescriber or clozapine, um, somebody who works with people on clozapine? And to be honest, I don't put my hand up here. And I've, I've, I've published a couple of papers on clozapine, but I never do a clinic where someone doesn't say, well, well Dan, why is this happening to me? Or why can't you fix this? Or why is this a problem? And I think to myself, gosh, I... I can't answer that. I don't know the answer. So I always come out of a clozapine clinic with a bunch of questions that I need to work out how to answer. And some of those things um, form the basis of the talk I'm presenting to you today. So I've got a lot of things to talk about. I'm not going to get to everything. Today, I'm going to give you a bit of a historical perspective of clozapine. I'm going to talk about some of the evidence for efficacy. And then I'm going to talk to you some strategies about augmentation. I've got a talk on adverse effects that goes for about an hour and a half, and we don't have time for that today. Um, you know, if this is something which you guys are interested in and you're not sick of me, you can let Julia know. Uh, and perhaps if, if, uh, if I'm fortunate, I'll get invited back another day. Okay, so first of all, I want to remind you about treatment refractory schizophrenia. And I'm going to guess most of you guys know this, but there's the, the TRIP working group, an international working group that kind of came up with a definition that says two adherent trials with um, adequate dose and duration. So that's 600 chlorpromazine equivalents for six weeks. Um, when people actually take it. Um, so, you know, we know that they're actually taking it. And if at the end of those two trials, people have ongoing symptoms and functional deficits, because this is an illness of function, not just symptoms, um, then we consider people who've got treatment, these people to have treatment refractory schizophrenia. And if we think that 1% of the population have schizophrenia, when we look at um, the first episode cohort studies and follow them up over time, including a, a really important study that Julia was a part of back in the UK, we find that about a quarter of people who have first episode schizophrenia will go on to develop treatment of fractal schizophrenia as part of that first episode. And then you've got some, another group of people who develop, sorry, who respond initially, but then develop resistance later on. Um, and so that comes to about a third of all people with schizophrenia have a treatment refractory illness, a really high proportion of people who haven't had adequate symptom and functional relief. All right, can anyone tell me who this handsome guy is? Can anyone, anyone name this right? If you can be right into the chat, who is this handsome fellow? I've got some people raising their hands. Can you guys, talk, anyone type in the chat who this is? This is more to test whether or not you can type into this and whether or not it's working. Okay. Julia, I'm getting some people in the Q&A who are typing things in the q and I'm guessing the chat is disabled. Um, okay, great. I'll just have a quick squeeze into the Q&A. Um, Wolverine, thank you. Chat's disabled, Waldo, a huge excellent, 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 wonderful. Okay, so 
what was the first antipsychotic? Did anyone type into the Q&A, what was the first antipsychotic? Oh, Gactyl, excellent. Chlorpromazine. And when did that come about? When did that start happening? Chlorpromazine, I've got a few. When, when did that one come about? And oh, there we go, early 50s. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, but yeah, early 50s, about 1952. Clozapine started coming around 1958. So a really long time ago, 65 years ago, clozapine has been around. And so a bit like Wolverine, been around for a long time, um, stays fresh and evergreen, you know, always useful and helpful. However, much like Wolverine, there were some problems in the 1970s. Can someone tell me what the problems were in the 1970s with clozapine? What was the issue? I'm loving all the answers coming in here. Cardiac, blood just crazy, blood just crazy, excellently, wonderful. So people started developing neutropenia um, and a few people developed agranulocytosis and died. And this happened in Finland. And can anyone tell me why they noticed it in Finland? This is a, what, a, an AP, extra credit question. Why did they notice it in Finland? Because it's cold, interesting. Okay, I like that answer. Um, any other, what, Finns have a really amazing um, linked data set which talks about medications and mortality. So because of their wonderful national linked data sets, they keep records of everything, exactly. So they noticed it. And, and in actual fact, what was happening probably was what we call a cluster event, which is when rare events happen all around the same time. So um, when I was at uni, there was an ABC building in town, uh, in Brisbane, and a bunch of people developed cancer in that building. And so cancers are rare events, and the building was full of people who were people who might be at risk of cancer, sort of older men and women, as well as younger women who developed breast cancer. And so they wondered, well, was the ground contaminated? Or was this a cluster event when sometimes rare events, which are real events, happen around the same time? And what we think happened in Finland was that you got had, we had a cluster. So a real event, clozapine associated neutropenia and agranulocytosis all occurred around the same time. And this was the canary in the coal mine that made us realize that we need to really be monitoring um, absolute neutrophil counts in people on clozapine. And so once we started bringing monitoring in as a kind of a standard approach, usage recommenced around the world. And it still continued in a few jurisdictions as, um, as a kind of a compassionate ground. So people had really had a good response, um, but it's kind of getting um, available again in 1993 in Australia. Um, and so this chart here kind of shows usage around the world between the mid 2000s to the mid um, 2010s. It's a little bit old now, but this is one of the, the best studies that we've had around um, usage rates around the world. And so what country uses it the most? Can anyone tell me? There's clues over here, by the way. So what countries uses it the most? We've talked about this country before. Finland, 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 wonderful, wonderful. Actually, USA, no. USA is one of the crummier countries in terms of its usage because of its disastrous public health care system. I trained there and I almost never used clozapine in public clinics because they just they, were, they didn't have the resources. And then Australia is around the middle of the pack. So we were getting about 60 per 100,000 total population using clozapine in Australia. Now, I want to remind you, we said that one quarter to a third of people with schizophrenia have treatment refractory illness. So if we look at that shading, and so this is in the fifth to a third, so a quarter to a third um, of people with schizophrenia. Only the Finns are probably adequately providing clozapine for people with treatment affected schizophrenia. And Australia, we're giving maybe a quarter of the people who have treatment affected schizophrenia even one dose of clozapine. So we're, we're wildly under prescribing clozapine for people with treatment affected schizophrenia. We're really underserving our population here. Okay, so. I've given you a bit of a historical perspective of where clozapine came about, and then I'm telling you that we're underprescribing it, but why? Why should we be using it more often? What's the evidence for its efficacy? So um, John Kane was this, uh, is still a fabled psychiatrist. He's just sort of thinking about retiring around now. He works at the Long Island Jewish Hospital in um, New York. And um, they, 
started uh, a, a, a clinical research study there on clozapine for treatment of refractory schizophrenia. So this was done in the late 80s. So most of the consumers who were enrolled in this trial were in state facilities, so long-term long hospitalizations. And in order to enter the trial, you had to have three failed neuroleptics, plus you had to be given haloperidol for six weeks. Why would they make people have haloperidol for six weeks before entering them into a trial? This is a, a tricky one to type into a QA. and a all right, so the reason was um, because sometimes people say, oh, I, I didn't, this medication didn't work, but then we find out they never tried the medications and some people aren't adherent with medications, um, which is their choice. Um, so they were given haloperidol for six weeks and if they didn't have a response to haloperidol, then they entered the trial and they managed to recruit 268 people. Julia and I do a lot of clinical trials and um, we, uh, we really struggle to recruit that many people these days. So this is an amazingly large and effective recruitment. Their double blind comparison with chlorpromazine it was a short trial of only six weeks duration. But interestingly, of the people who were enrolled, 30% of the clozapine group responded and only 4% of the chlorpromazine. So much more effective in this group of people with treatment refractory schizophrenia. Um, and then, you know, greater improvements on BPRS, which is our overall psychosis rating scale and other ratings of, 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 of um, psychotic symptoms. So, with some registrars a few years back, we looked at all the studies which had compared clozapine to another antipsychotic for people with treatment refractory schizophrenia. And what we found was in these studies that were under three months long, clozapine was far superior. But interestingly, it didn't show statistically significant superiority um, in the longer term. And so let's unpack that. What, what, well, how can we make meaning of that? And so when they looked at positive symptoms, so we just looked at all the studies which reported positive symptoms, you know, the voices, the delusions, um, ideas of reference. In short-term and long-term studies, clozapine was far superior to all other antipsychotics for managing positive symptoms. But when we looked at negative symptoms, not as effective, um, you know, it wasn't more effective for negative symptoms. And this really fits with what I see in my clinics is that the consumers I, I serve often tell me, look, I'm not as bothered by the aliens and the bikies and the neighbors aren't harassing me as much, but I, I still don't want to have a shower and I'm, I'm not too sure I want to find a job. Um, so that motivation doesn't necessarily get better, but the, the, the positive symptoms do get better. The other thing which we, we looked at was a lot of the studies that we were included were funded by the pharmaceutical industry. And so I, I kind of was involved in, in as a medical student and a, and a trainee in the 90s and the 2000s. And there were drug reps everywhere in the hospitals I went who all said, our new drug, risperidone, olanzapine, quetiapine, it's just as good as clozapine and it doesn't have any side effects at all. And this was how people were promoting their drugs. Um, so when we excluded the studies which were funded by the pharmaceutical companies, um, clozapine was statistically significantly superior to all other antipsychotics at all time points um, for positive and negative symptoms as well. And so we tried to work out, well, why were the pharmaceutical fund industry funded studies um, uh, less favorable to clozapine? And so we looked at the dosing and there's this thing called a chlorpromazine equivalent. It's a way to compare doses between different medications because two milligrams of risperidone is not the same as two milligrams of clozapine or two milligrams of olanzapine or two milligrams of quetiapine. Um, and clozapine was getting a much lower dose. And so I'm, I haven't used a lot of chlorpromazine in my career, but I've, I, I used a lot of olanzapine. And when we use olanzapine equivalents, people were getting 10 milligrams less um, in the clozapine arm than they were in the comparator arm. So that's kind of like comparing someone on five milligrams of olanzapine to 15 milligrams of olanzapine. And unsurprisingly, people on a higher dose probably will have a better response. So when we excluded the half of the studies with the greatest difference in dosage, again, clozapine statistically significantly superior at all time points um, for managing um, psychotic symptoms. The other thing we found is in studies that had a greater baseline psychosis score, so people who were overall more unwell when they entered the study, they were much more likely to um, respond to clozapine. And uh, I thought, you know, this kind of fits with what I see in practices that the people who are really quite unwell, um, clozapine is going to have a, a more, uh, more, more powerful impact. So I don't know if there's any hospital directors in here, but whenever I'm talking to hospital directors and I tell them, oh, clozapine is really effective at reducing symptoms, they, they, don't, they don't seem to be as passionate as when I mentioned this. 
And this was about whether or not clozapine keeps people out of hospital. So um, here's, uh, here's my hospital looking, in, in, I don't know how they got the hospital to look this attractive, it's clearly been photoshopped. But what they did was they, they looked at um, studies where people had hospitalizations before and after starting clozapine. And they looked at whether or not the number, we, we, we looked at whether or not the number of bed days in the year before starting clozapine changed to the year after. So if you got started on clozapine, you were, you had 34 bed days fewer in the year after. So a really massive reduction in hospital bed days. And, and for hospital administrators for whom bed days are dollars, um, this is something that, uh, that they're really interested in. Moreover, when we looked at the rate of rehospitalization reduced by about 25%, and this was in randomized control trials, non-randomized control trials against all different other medications. Um, some of these ones here against haloperidol and depots, really wide confidence intervals because there weren't many studies. So probably um, superior, but just because of the way stats work, didn't show up a difference. And when I'm talking to consumers and their carers and loved ones, it's um, the study by Dentian Vermeulen that I most frequently um, cite. So she looked at mortality for people who were on clozapine versus any other medication. And all cause mortality, that's suicide, cardiovascular outcomes, diabetes, all causes of death. If you were on clozapine, you were half as likely to die than people on any other antipsychotic. So you're half as likely to die on clozapine. And although another day we can talk about the side effects of clozapine, even bringing those side effects into consideration, you're half as likely to die if you're on clozapine. So another thing I often think about in terms of efficacy or effectiveness of the medication, <coughs> effectiveness is do consumers want to take their medication? So a few years back, they did a study called the Katy study, which was a government funded study in the US, wasn't funded by a drug company, which compared olanzapine, uh, risperidone, quetiapine, aripiprazole, clozapine. And they looked at whether or not consumers who were enrolled in this study um, we're still on the medications at 18 months, which is a study endpoint. And the medication which turned out best was olanzapine. Can anyone tell me what percentage of people were still on olanzapine 18 months after starting the clinical trial? Just take a guess as to what percentage was still on olanzapine at 18 months. You can pop that into the Q&A if you want to. 20% we've got, all right, any other guesses? 30, 40, 30, okay, 30%. Some of you guys have read the Katie study. Well, good, well done. So at 18 months after this study, 30% were on it. If we look at this on this chart in clozapine, this is a real world um, time series of people who got started on clozapine in Queensland in the mid, from the mid 2000s to the mid 2010s. 60% um, of people who got started on clozapine were still on it at 18 months. And in the Katie study, you got paid to be involved in the trial because it was a clinical trial. You had you know, very attractive research assistants to try and lure people to come in to the appointments. Um, you got phone calls and reminders. In this particular time set, you got me, like a, you know, a funny looking middle-aged psychiatrist and you didn't get paid and consumers still stayed on the medication. And in fact, after 18 weeks, we had this very large drop to 25% of people have stopped clozapine in the first 18 weeks. But by five years, half of all the consumers who got started on clozapine were still taking it. And that I think is a real testimony to the fact that consumers like being on clozapine. It's doing something that they value. Um, so the other thing I often talk to trainees and case managers about, they say to me, X is never gonna take clozapine. They're too unwell. Um, we shouldn't even bother trying to treat them. And what I can say to them is that in the first 18 weeks, half of the people who are gonna stop clozapine are gonna stop in the first three weeks. And so some of those people are gonna stop because they've had an adverse event. Some of them are gonna stop because they just don't want it. But you're gonna know really early on whether or not clozapine is something the consumers are gonna take. You're gonna know within three weeks if it's gonna be acceptable um, and whether or not they're gonna stay on it. Because again, you know, a quarter of people stop in the first 18 weeks, half of those people who stop are in the first three weeks. So when case managers say, look, um, you know, this patient X over here, they're, they're a lost cause. There's no point in treating them. I'll say to them, well, I, I, I don't have that lack of hope. I do have hope. Um, and I think a trial of clozapine, you're gonna know pretty quickly about whether or not it's gonna be something which is acceptable to that particular consumer. So it's worth giving people a try for something which is really a life-saving medication. All right, who here is an optimist? If you're an optimist, type the word optimist. 
if you're a pessimist, you can type the word realist into the chat. But like this one here is a bit of a raw shock. So who who's here is an optimist? Um, who here is a pessimist? Optimist and pessimist. Own up if you want to let me know if you're an optimist or a pessimist. You know what? We might do this more fair. If you're an optimist, um, put up your hand. All the optimists put up their hand right now. Okay, we've got a wow, look at you guys. Optimists putting up their hands. Okay, so optimists are looking at this picture. And this is a picture by an artist here called Painted Bees, which I found on the interwebs. Um, and, you know, this is a, a picture about a friend of theirs who's on clozapine and they try to capture that. And so, you know, the optimists look at this and say, there's a fairy here, there's an angel. There's this beautiful green pathway coming out of this person's kitchen. The stairs are going up, there's a bright light. This consumer is on clozapine and life is getting better. All right, so you can, optimists can put their hands down. Do we have any of the pessimists slash realists here? Rest pessimists or realists pop, pop up their hand. Okay, yes, I'm seeing the numbers are going up. Lots of people are raising their hands now. Okay, so the pessimists who, who call themselves realists might look at them and say, ooh, this consumer is pretty skinny. The pills are knocked over, they've, they've fallen on the ground. I think they're not adherent with their medication. Their symptoms have gotten worse. And this, this is a psychotic delusion they're seeing. So that's what the, the, the pessimist realist might see. So this artwork here is a bit of a raw shark for how you view, um, view healthcare. Um, but what I take out of this art is someone likes clozapine so much, they did this particularly pleasing artwork about it. And there's really very little testimony about how um, acceptable a medication is um, than, uh, than artwork. Oh, hello, the chat's, a, chat's enabled now. So I think I've got lots of people telling me they're optimists and realists in the chat now. Okay, good stuff. Okay, so let's talk about how to augment clozapine and why we might need to think about this. So I've told you that 1% of people have schizophrenia, that a quarter to a third of people um, will develop treatment refractory schizophrenia over the course of their illness. Um, I've also told you that clozapine is really effective at reducing psychotic symptoms. However, not everyone is going to adequately respond. So um, this is a paper I did with, with my dad. Um, it's a very proud moment for me. And what we did is we looked at the rates of response. And by response, this was defined as a reduction in the PAN score, plus some changes in some other um, observation measures of consumers' psychotic symptoms. And if you went below a particular threshold, you were considered to have had a response. Um, and so 40% of people who were on clozapine in these clinical trials achieved a response rate. Now that's not to say that not everyone improved. There was overall a reduction in PANS of around 25%, which is a really sizable amount, but not everyone met these sort of clinical trial set response criteria. We still have around 60% of people who are still having um, really troubling psychotic symptoms. So they, they may have improved from before they started clozapine, but they were still struggling. And this fits with what I see in the clinics of the consumers that I serve, is that some of the consumers I'm serving are still saying, look, I'm not as bothered by the neighbors harassing me, but I'm still bothered, you know, it's, it's still troubling me. And so what do we do about this fairly sizable proportion, 60% of people on clozapine who are still having ongoing symptoms? So we did a systematic review um, a few years back, which we're in the process of updating, where we looked at what happens when you augment with another antipsychotic? So we looked at a bunch of different antipsychotics. The best evidence was for aripiprazole. And aripiprazole was um, the most uh, commonly studied antipsychotic. A lot of these studies came from mainland China. Uh, and um, thank you for asking what the PANS is. And thank, thank you very much for answering that one in the chat. Uh, that um, a lot of studies were from mainland China. And, and when we looked at the quality of those studies, they weren't super flash. So when we excluded the studies which had poor quality, our approval wasn't statistically significant, but overall, when we included those ones, um, it is statistically significant. Um, but other antipsychotics, a little bit unclear as to whether or not they're helping. Amisulpride trending towards it, but a little bit unclear. There was a really seminal study of ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, for um, people who did not have an adequate response to clozapine out of um, Long Island Jewish. This was, was the same hospital where um, John Kane, we previously mentioned, worked. And what they did was they randomized people to either ECT or treatment as usual, because you can't give sham ECT. It's not safe to give someone an anesthetic and then 
not give them a treatment. So they just gave treatment as usual. But interestingly, 50% of the people who were given ECT, a short course of ECT, achieved a response criteria. Uh, and that was a really significant response criteria, criteria the 50, 40% reduction in the brief psychiatric rating scale, was a, a rating scale of psychiatric psychotic symptoms. Um, and no one in the treatment as usual group achieved a response. So ECT really effective in reducing it. Now, I um, don't know about your state, but in order for me to advocate for a consumer to receive ECT, if they, they are deprived of the capacity to consent, I need to go to a, um, a court, a mental health review tribunal. And so when I am talking about someone who, who's really tortured by their symptoms, um, who might benefit from ECT because they haven't had an adequate response to clozapine, I cite this Petridi study. So I, I, I use the study a lot to talk to to um, the, <clears throat> what we call a mental health review tribunal to advocate for someone to get ECT. Then they looked at the people who had a response and, and anyone who was in the treatment as usual group was then given an opportunity to have ECT to see if they could respond. And if the people respond, they got a continuation ECT. Um, so they were given sort of fortnightly or monthly ECT. Um, and that led to um, you know, sustained improvement. So sometimes I've got two of the consumers um, that I, I, I see. Um, who uh, get maintenance ECT. One of them gets it fortnightly, and um, it's usually by day uh, um, day sort of 10 or 12 after ECT, she, she's really tormented by symptoms and then they improve after the ECT. And I've got another chap who, who gets it every four weeks. And um, if he doesn't, if he misses it, um, then he starts kind of with really problematic behavior and starts being at risk of losing his housing and his hostel. So continuing ECT was really effective for consumers um, in this study. And when I'm seeking continuation ECT from my mental health review tribunal, this is the study that I'm quoting. All right, so we, a group of us looked at closet medication strategies and we kind of reviewed all the evidence and graded it um, because the studies are, are patchy in their quality. Uh, and then their findings. So what we found, there's two different recommendations. There's this sort of grade recommendation, which is a internationally used recommendation scale. And then the sign, which is a Scottish intercollegiate one, which kind of tells you how, how good the evidence is. So first and second generation antipsychotics have the best evidence. Um, then antidepressants, lithium, um, less good. Glutamatergics, these are some of the um, anti-dementia medications not very effective. ECT, very effective. And then things like RTMS, which is a magnetic, um, transcranial magnetic simulation, not particularly effective. Then another way of trying to work out how effective augmentation strategies is, is to look at large epidemiological studies. So we're gonna go back to Finland now, and this is um, Yari Tionen and, and Hadi Tapale, who do some really amazing large epidemiological studies of these Finnish linked data sets. And they looked at any consumer who had schizophrenia and they looked at what medications they were given and whether or not they had a psychiatric rehospitalization. And so you can see down here, the one that was the worst was quetiapine and monotherapy. And up here at the top, you were least likely to have a rehospitalization if you were on these combinations. So clozapine and aripiprazole was the most effective combination. Next was any long acting injectable in the lanzapine, then clozapine and lanzapine, clozapine, clozapine and a long acting injectable, clozapine and risperidone, clozapine and quetiapine, and clozapine and any other oral medication. <clears throat> um, so you've got these medications here, <coughs> um, of which, you know, almost all of these are clozapine or clozapine plus something else with clozapine and aripiprazole just a tick to the left of everything else. So that gives me some confidence that using real world data, and these are, are consumers who aren't necessarily involved in clinical trials. Um, these are just consumers who are in the country where the data set exists, um, that these ones are the best medications. All right. So another way of kind of working out what to do is, is BOGSAT. That stands for a bunch of guys sitting around a table. And I'm embarrassed to say that everyone was a man in this particular study. Um, and so we got a bunch of, of, of middle-aged white well, almost all white men who sat around and um, emailed each other during the pandemic and said, um, we reckon this is the thing you should do for people um, with schizophrenia. So I do apologize for the, for the patriarchy here. That is actually genuinely embarrassing. But here's what we found. And so this is what I do in the clinics where I work um, about managing uh, people who have an inadequate response. Uh, first of all, I will use a rating scale like a BPRS and a PANS to see how people's symptoms are at baseline. Um, 
because if I'm adding something and it's not making anything better, if the if the psychotic symptoms have not improved, I don't want to burden the consumers I serve with additional medication. So if they're not making a change, I'm going to cease it. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check the clozapine levels. And uh, there aren't a lot of drugs in psychiatry, lithium, clozapine, valparate, where we have therapeutic drug monitoring, but I am checking the clozapine levels. And we've just um, had a, a really large paper um, accepted the British Journal of Psychiatry looking at clozapine levels. And the range is really around 350 and then in the range of sort of 250 to 550. Um, this just got accepted a couple of days ago before I could update the slides, um, where that's the kind of the sweet spot. You want your level somewhere around 300 to 600 uh, to, to be ensuring that someone's got an adequate response and probably above 350 to really ensure. Because sometimes I, I see people who have been referred to me and they say, look, this consumer has not had adequate response to clozapine. And I look and they're someone who is what we call a fast metabolizer. That is, they're breaking down the clozapine really quickly in their blood. Um, and even though they're on a 400 milligram a day dose, their levels are sitting around 100. So I'm going to optimize the clozapine levels um, to get them in that therapeutic range. And there's a few strategies we, we don't need to talk about today to kind of get that, but that might involve increasing the dose or adding another medication which boosts clozapine. Then I'm going to wait about six weeks. And even if after optimizing the clozapine levels to a therapeutic range, they're not having an adequate response, I'm going to start having a conversation with them about what are the choices. So the next thing I might do is I might add another antipsychotic. And... I'm usually thinking about adding aripiprazole as my first line because um, it tends to not cause much weight gain. Um, and if you add it in the morning, it tends to make people a little bit less tired. So it's usually a fairly safe medication to add as an augmenting agent. Um, the other one I might consider is amisulpride. Um, amisulpride has a, an interesting side effect in that it, it actually makes drooling a little bit better for people who have some drooling and your pride is it can, can be helpful um, and it also tends not to cause much weight gain i'm then going to wait six to eight weeks and see whether or not their psychotic symptoms improve with adding a second antipsychotic or whether or not their function improves or whether or not they're less bothered by the symptoms that they're experiencing and some and, and often that works if that is not been helpful. And the consumer is telling me that they're still tormented by their symptoms. I've got one particular consumer who, um, if she doesn't get ACT, she, she gets these, um, what she calls her demons. Um, and she's actively trying to, to, to kill herself because she's just so tormented by the symptoms. Um, and so I, for those consumers, I'm gonna suggest a short course of ECT and see whether or not ECT can help improve their psychotic symptoms. And you'll know, you know, within around six to eight treatments, whether or not ECT has been helpful. Um, then if ECT in a short course is helpful, I'm gonna sort of see how things go over the next few months. If their symptoms start getting worse again, I'm gonna have a conversation with them about maintenance ECT because um, it can be really, really helpful. Then if we're not had any benefit, then, then we're starting to get to places where the evidence is a little bit thinner. Um, I might think about adding an antidepressant if people are depressed um, or if they've got really challenging negative symptoms that are hard to disentangle from um, from depression or negative symptoms, I might think about adding an antidepressant. Um, if I'm adding something like fluoxetine, I'm going to monitor their clozapine levels. I'm not going to use fluoxamine for managing depression because it really messes with people's clozapine levels. Um, I'm going to think about adding a mood stabilizer. I probably don't add a lot of valparate because it can make people um, heavy. People can gain weight. It can mess with people's white cells. Um, it can make people a bit more cognitively slow. So if I'm adding a mood stabilizer, often I'm looking, often I'm looking at um, lithium or lamotrigine, uh, the ones that I tend to, to look at. And then moreover, no matter where we are in this hierarchy, <clears throat> I'm thinking about adding CBT for psychosis. Um, and so we've got some pretty good evidence that CBT for psychosis among people with clozapine refractory schizophrenia can help improve symptoms. It's probably not going to make the um, delusions and the positive symptoms go away, but it is going to be really effective at helping people be less bothered by them. And so that's the focus I'm working at with CBTP is to help people live with their symptoms and be able to tolerate them better. Now, Julia, I have kind of whizzed through because I think I might have been a little nervous at this amazingly large audience and I might have talked a little bit fast. So when, if you're playing this back on the video, maybe use one of those uh, control systems which slow it down. And we've, we, we've, we've gotten to 40 minutes past. And so I would, we could have a choice here, Julia. I could talk 
a little bit of adverse events, but I don't think I'd do it justice, or we could have a longer conversation about some of the challenges um, that we face with working with people with clozapine um, who don't have adequate responses or, or kind of you know, thinking through some of those challenges. What's your preference? Thanks, Dan. That was a fantastic talk. I <clears throat> suspect from the engagement that we've had so far from all the participants in the audience that the time might be best spent answering questions that people may have for you. Um, so why don't we say that we'll do that today and I will definitely take you up on your offer and invite you back at another time, maybe next year, um, because I think that adverse events associated with clozapine would be another great topic. So thank you very much, Dan, for a really wonderful uh, summary of clozapine, its benefits and some of the, some of the downsides. Great to get that historical viewpoint. I would like to invite everybody at this stage to write any questions for Dan in the Q&A because we can there keep track of the Q&A. You, you're welcome to keep chatting in the webinar chat, but please enter any questions that you might have in the Q&A. Just to get us started, Dan, um, I'll, I'll ask a question. Uh, you know, we, we've used the term today, treatment refractory, psychosis, treatment resistant psychosis is, is another term that we use. You mentioned that about a third of people who develop uh, a psychotic illness will meet criteria for illness that doesn't respond to treatment, that's treatment resistance. And one of the key issues uh, in clozapine over the years has been the people have sort of held back and said, oh, well, you know, clozapine, well, we wouldn't do that in a young person. We'll wait a few years, you know, we'll just, or, or maybe, you know, maybe we could, we'll hold that, hold clozapine off until we really, you know, don't have any other options. And that's understandable. There are, uh, you know, obstacles associated with clozapine treatment with the monitoring. It's also, um, sometimes difficult to persuade people to start clozapine. But my question for you is, you know, based on the evidence, um, when's the right time to start clozapine? Yeah, Julia, that's a really, really thorny issue, isn't it? Because when we look at retrospective data sets where people, um, when people get clozapine, it's often five years after their first episode of psychosis. And the thing is, we're gonna know within 12 weeks whether or not someone has treatment resistant schizophrenia. You know, two adequate trials of six weeks where there's been, you know, monitoring and, and making sure that people are actually adherent to medication. You're gonna know within 12 weeks. So I think we should be much more assertive um, as clinicians in advocating for our consumers to get the best evidence medication. Now, yes. given clozapine does have a lot of side effects, I'm not gonna ever use it first line or even second line. I wanna give people a trial of aripiprazole or risperidone because they're probably more weight neutral and more tolerable. Um, but we should be doing this much earlier. And I think there is a, what we call uh, clozophobia. There's a phobia of putting people on clozapine because um, of the, you know, the adverse events that we, we could talk about another day, but half as likely to die. Half as likely to die if you're on clozapine versus any other antipsychotic. That's powerful, powerful numbers. So I think we need to be better in our clinical services and talking to clinicians about, um, about the benefits of it. I, I noticed there was a question um, that Meredith Fleming has put in, Julia, that says, how do you yes. go conversing with another clinician who says they will never take clozapine? And this is tricky. This is really tricky because we've got some, I, I, I remember I had a consumer who, who lived um, in my catchment and every two weeks I would go there with the police and a locksmith and they would break down her door and she would be under the bed, um, very psychotic, and she would get a depot and we would say, I'm so sorry. And, you know, the clinician said, she'll never take clozapine. She's too unwell, you know, with lost cause. So we invited her into hospital because she was really awfully unwell, um, started clozapine and um, she now lives independently, takes clozapine. Um, you know, she still has some residual symptoms, but she doesn't have to go through the indignity of having police and a locksmith to lock it, break down her door every two weeks in order to That's give right. her an That's underperforming right. depot. I agree, Dan. And sometimes we plant a seed. We talk about clozapine early in the piece. We revisit it after a difficult relapse. 
We talk about it with family and networks that are trusted by the individual. Sometimes it really is playing the long game and really trying to um, elicit what people's concerns are. Many very justified, you know, worries about blood tests, um, needles, regular monitoring, which can generate some, you know, paranoia among some people. And really just trying to, to walk with that person through those difficulties. Now, Dan, we've got lots, we've got lots of questions coming through. I'm, I'm going to that. start with those in the Q&A. Yes. Um, so just touching on the point we made earlier about how early to start clozapine. Um, someone has asked specifically, do you have thoughts on clozapine for younger consumers? Yeah, and so I think that we we had a wonderful colleague in in Melbourne, um, Brian O'Donoghue, who who sadly um, went back to Ireland. But um, Julia and I still hear a lot from him. I certainly I hear a lot from him. Um, and he did some really interesting studies looking at origin and starting consumers on clozapine earlier. And it's made a huge difference for the consumers, um, you know, who, who who are young people. There's two studies which looked at clozapine for um, childhood onset schizophrenia and really wide margins of, of improvement over um, the competitor medications in those trials. So I think I would really be advocating for younger people to be on clozapine earlier if they have treatment resistant schizophrenia so they can achieve those milestones of adolescence. Of so separation try, in, in a way, it's a form of early intervention, isn't it? Given that the really effective treatment. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. For that. I'm going to whiz through a few more questions. Uh, Carol Barnes has asked, could you touch on myocarditis and clozapine and re-challenge? We yeah. see a lot of these issues in CL psychiatry. Yes, um, a thorny issue and something which I'm doing a lot of work on at the moment around clozapine and myocarditis. We have the highest rates of myocarditis in the world in Australia um, and nowhere else in the world sees as much myocarditis as we do. Um, and so, you know, is that because of the Coriolis effect or is this because we're just looking a lot harder and it's happening in other jurisdictions and they're not noticing it? Um, or is it something which is sort of time limited and gets better over time? So it's, it's really um, a tricky issue. Some of the questions I'm noticing are also coming around clozapine myocarditis rechallenge. I can't answer that today, but I'm doing a large project looking at clozapine myocarditis and rechallenge and coming up with a, um, a myocarditis rechallenge protocol. But what we think is it go slow, go very slowly in terms of the titration when you're doing a re-challenge. But I can't answer that question today. I should be able to answer it in a year. Okay, well, that sounds good. So we've got Western New South Wales Kios asking, how do you manage the concern of weight gain? Yeah. I find psychiatrists are resistant to using clozapine even though it's indicated. But the yeah. alanzapine, which is also a, 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 you know likely to give a lot of weight gain. Yes, I, I, I find that totally ironic in that I've, you know, I, I'm on call in an, for the emergency department and, and getting calls from the trainees who are like, oh no, I started this person on 20 milligrams of olanzapine. I'm really worried about them getting weight gain with clozapine. Like, what the hey? Olanzapine and quetiapine are just as great an offender. So we've done a few studies um, on looking at what happens when you start clozapine at the same time as metformin. And so we did a large clinical trial um, which I could talk about another day, but where we randomized people to get, who, these people were being started on clozapine anyway um, by their treating teams, and we randomized them to metformin or placebo. And unfortunately, this study got shut down because of the pandemic. We didn't get all the way through it. But what we found was if you got started on metformin, you were much less likely to gain weight. And then we went back and did a retrospective chart audit of anyone who'd been started on clozapine at our service and, and a number of other services in Southeast Queensland over the past five years. And we looked at, were these, any of these people on metformin anyway in that first year after starting clozapine versus people who weren't on metformin? If you were on metformin, much less weight gain. And so some colleagues of ours at CAMH in Toronto did exactly the same thing. If they got started on metformin in the year after starting clozapine, much less weight gain. Um, so there really does seem to be this indication that co-commencement of clozapine and metformin might reduce clozapine-associated weight gain. Now, some people don't like throwing too many medications at their consumers, and some consumers don't want to take too many medications when they're starting one medication. Um, so you do want to be really watchful if you're not starting metformin at the same time as you're starting clozapine. Um, and if they're starting to gain weight at metformin early um, and going up to two grams a day. Uh, I can tell you if it was my relative and they had to start clozapine, I would be strongly advocating them to start metformin at the same time. Or even, even just before the clozapine starts. 
or even just before sure yeah right yep yep thanks dan all right well yodas and garis has got a question do you have any thoughts as to why there appears to be more of a reluctance to prescribe clozapine in australia as opposed to other countries we're actually not so bad we're kind of in the middle <laughs> we're in the uh, middle yeah we're much better than japan or um united states and we're kind of on par with a lot of the european countries and in fact we're prescribing it a lot more than we did a decade ago it's just that particular data set i've had to interrogate another data set and we found it's still steadily increasing the proportion yeah. of people and we could of course get better we could get better and hopefully <laughs> hopefully webinars like this will increase people's willingness to think about clozapine a bit more exactly julia typically the advocacy that your group is working on is, is really important for helping overcome the clozophobia yeah all right so dr michael payton has a question he's referring to the work that you did with nick miles and the meta-analysis so based on the evidence michael asks should we be arguing for discontinuing blood monitoring as this put so many consumers off clozapine michael it, it, it's funny you should mention that i've got two large data studies which are in progress at the moment um where i am trying to ascertain whether or not we need to continue clozapine monitoring after 18 weeks. Um, as neither of those are published yet, I can't tell you that I think we shouldn't monitor after 18 weeks. I can't say that. Um, but um, once we do some more analyses, I, I think we're going to get some really interesting results, which may be really helpful at helping understand whether or not clozapine monitoring needs to go on. Julia, I, I noticed one of these questions that has come up a few times is yes. this. Um, well, if we didn't monitor people on clozapine, would they still do well? Yeah. And so there's the kind of what's the, um, uh, oh gosh, the, oh God, I'm having, the opioid, what's the daily, methadone, the methadone approach, which is that people on opioids do well because they've got to come in and take methadone every day. People on clozapine only do well because they've got to come in and see a doctor every four weeks and get a blood test. There are a lot of jurisdictions in the world that don't do monitoring. Iceland is pretty lax. They don't mandate it. And people still do fine on clozapine. In fact, their outcomes are just as good I do not think it's the monitoring that's making the difference. I think it's the clozapine. So even if we were able to stop monitoring, um, if we can find the evidence to show that the rates of neutropenia are not um, concerning after 18 weeks, I think people would still do well. Great. All right, we've got an anonymous attendee asking, what's the best way to set up a service to monitor and capture those who could benefit from clozapine early? It's a big question. <laughs> Julia, I think that's your your stance, isn't it? Right? <laughs> well, I can answer that. That's a cheeky um, side pass, but I will take that one. So I think really, as clinicians, we need to be thinking about why are people not responding to treatment? Are they taking it? That's the first question. If they're taking it and they're at an adequate dose, that one's not working for them. If they're not getting better after four to six weeks, so you move to another one, if it's still not working, make sure they're taking it by starting a, a depot. If they're still not responding, you've identified treatment resistance. So I think this is a job that we as clinicians can do ourselves, and then we can move to um, the discussions around, uh, you know, are you willing to give clozapine a try? So I don't think we need a separate clinic. I think this is well within our ballpark. I would agree, Julia. All right. Now, Loretta, this is a great question. Dan, can people begin developing tolerance to clozapine and need higher doses? Yeah, I wonder about this one. And so there's nested in this question is that clozapine is broken down in a particular pathway of enzymes in the liver. Um, and there are other medications which can impede this pathway, which make levels get higher. And there are other medications which can speed up the breakdown, um, such as smoking, uh, notably. So I think someone said, you know, if someone, if someone quits smoking and they go on nicotine replacement therapy, it's actually these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the smoke, not the nicotine, which induces the enzymes to break down clozapine faster. And so there are a number of things which can change people's clozapine levels. I am always doing clozapine levels on my consumers. I'm monitoring it from month to month because it tells me whether or not the consumer is adherent um, you know, some people don't feel like they need to be taking the medication, even though there might be objective evidence to, to say that they should be taking the medication. They, they made a choice to not to. Um, and I can find that out if they're not openly telling me about that. It also tells me whether or not medication, the enzymes are being induced or um, being impeded. And so I'm just keeping an eye on levels all the time. And I'm adjusting people's clozapine dose 
to that therapeutic range. So there are some people whose levels go up over time as they get older. What I see more often is that people's levels go um people's levels go up when they get older rather than go down. So I'm often for older people, I'm just down trading the clozapine so that I can give them the minimum possible dose to keep them in the therapeutic blood range. So I do encourage for those of you who have the capacity to write blood slips um, to be keeping an eye on clozapine levels to inform your dose so you're not over or under treating people. Thanks, Dan. Now a related question from New South Wales Sutherland Hospital Mental Health Rehab is, does NRT or smoking cigarettes have any effects on clozapine levels? Yes, 100%. And this is one of those really important things. And so I, I don't know about your hospitals, but our hospitals are allegedly non-smoking. People smoke all the time in my hospitals. Um, I suspect they do in yours as well. But sometimes if you've got someone who's been started on clozapine in hospital and they've been theoretically not smoking while they've been in hospital and they go back to smoking 40 a day, their clozapine levels are going to plummet. So you want to keep an eye on the levels and adjust the dose. Um, conversely, for a consumer who might have a infection somewhere, they've come into hospital um, with an infection and they're in a medical ward where it's really hard to smoke and they're giving nicotine replacement therapy because it's these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in the cigarette smoke, not the nicotine itself, their clozapine levels are going to spike when they go into hospital because they're not smoking. The enzymes which break down the clozapine are no longer being inhibited. Um, and so the clozapine levels are going to go up, up, up. Um, and moreover, an infection can also raise clozapine levels. So when someone switches from smoking to nicotine replacement therapy, their clozapine levels are going to go up, test the clozapine levels and adjust it. And if they're coming straight into hospital after smoking 40 a day um, and going into hospital, you're probably going to want to reduce the dose by about a third on day one of coming into hospital and then check their levels a couple of days later to make sure that you're monitoring things. Fantastic, Dan. I know that there are more questions coming through in the chat. I'm sorry that I just don't think we're going to have time today to answer all the questions. We see a lot of questions about side effects. If this is a topic that you would like us to cover in the webinar series and invite Dan back to talk about side effects, Julie Robottom from Mind Gardens is going to send everybody who attended today an email. Uh, asking for feedback and also asking for topics that you'd like covered. So please do write to us. We really want to provide you with information in these webinars, which is of value to you. I just want to thank Dan very much again for an absolutely fabulous talk. This hopefully will be the first of many. And I'll just ask Julie to share on the screen some information about the next webinar that we're organising through TRSP. And that one's over to me. So I'm going to talk about drug related psychosis, what to ask, and what to do. And that, that webinar will be in one month's time on Wednesday, the 15th of March. And we'll share those details in due course. And we'd love to see you back on a monthly basis joining us for this um, really important series aimed at enabling cl clinicians to work better with people who live with complex psychosis. So thanks everyone for your participation today and thanks again to Dan. Bye. Thank you all.